Seems like every day in the news we're seeing maps of Ukraine and Russia, and in that general area there's a fascinating little piece of land there we're going to look at today. Hi everyone, I'm your host Dan Hansen. This is another episode of Fun with Maps, and today we're going to look at a piece of Russia that you may know as Konigsberg or as its new name of Kaliningrad. You'll see, here's a map of Russia in red, big landmass here, and now we're talking about Kaliningrad right over here. Bounded by Lithuania here, and Poland here, and the Baltic Sea here. Kaliningrad is actually a city in the administrative center of Kaliningrad Oblast, a Russian exclave between Poland and Lithuania and the Baltic Sea. Remember that an enclave is a piece of land that is totally surrounded by a foreign territory. Remember in our Fun with Maps episode about Lesotho? Here's a map of Lesotho. We learned of the three sovereign states completely surrounded by another state. So Lesotho here is surrounded completely by South Africa. That's an enclave, and there's only other two other sovereign states in the world that are enclaves, and that's San Marino and Vatican City, both surrounded by Italy. An exclave is a piece of land that is politically attached to a larger piece, but not physically having the same borders with it because of surrounding foreign territory. Now closer to home, for an example, in Summit County, you all know where Akron, Ohio is. That's where LeBron James is from. It's about 40 miles south of me here. There's a uh, piece of land in Summit County, a city called Cuyahoga Falls, that is both an exclave and an enclave. There's some uh, streets there. I believe it's Smith Road. There's several houses along Smith Road in Cuyahoga Falls. They're legally in the Cuyahoga Falls, but their neighbors and the municipal uh, lands on all sides of the property are actually the city of uh, legally within Akron. So they're both enclaves and exclaves right here. And so you have enclaves and exclaves all over the world. There, as we said, there's only three sovereign states that are enclaves, but this is an exclave here because it's part of Russia, but it's not connected at all. It's connected Lithuania, Poland, and the Baltic Sea. Okay, so how did Russia get this piece of land? You've heard of Prussia, right? For like the last 700 years, this was called Konigsberg, and it's part of Prussia, which was part of Germany, and there's a whole history behind Prussia. But basically the story is after World War II, Germany had to give up a lot of its territory as punishment for its, uh, its uh, aggression in the war. So at the Potsdam Conference of 1945, the U.S., Great Britain, and Russia uh, decided they divvied up some of the land, and Russia was given this area here really without any issues. So let's take a deeper look into what was Konigsberg and is now Kaliningrad. Don't worry, I'm not going to give the whole history of Prussia. I mean, volumes of books have been written about that. The histories of Germany, Poland, Lithuania, Russia, and more are all intertwined with Prussia. But we will give a little background so we can understand the map. So here's a map of showing some settlements along the Baltic coastline of East Prussia from 1649. Okay, so here we've got, here's Konigsberg, which is what we're looking at today. Here's the Baltic Sea, first of all. Here's Konigsberg in the Duchy of Prussia. Here's Ermaland, which is another one of the German states. Here's the Kingdom of Poland, and this is Danzig. Today it's called Gdansk, of course. And here's the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And here's Memel, which uh, we know as Klaipeda today. So this gives you kind of an idea here how these things were. Here's Lithuania, Prussia, Germany, Poland, okay? So Konigsberg here was an historic Prussian city. It was founded in 1255 by the Teutonic Knights during the Northern Crusades and is named in honor of a king of uh, Bohemia. Prussia was a historically prominent German state. So Konigsberg here was the first capital of Prussia, okay? And it became the Kingdom of Prussia in 1701 and then in Berlin, uh, between Konigsberg and Berlin, they really decisively shaped the history of Germany. So this is a great painting of uh, the anointment of Frederick I after his, cor uh, his coronation as King of Prussia in Konigsberg in 1701, okay? So Prussia entered the ranks of the great powers shortly after becoming a kingdom. 
It became increasingly large and powerful in the 18th and 19th centuries and a major voice in European affairs under Frederick here, uh, Frederick the Great. And at the Congress of Vienna in 1814 and 15, they redrew the map of Europe after Napoleon's defeat. And Prussia acquired a lot of rich new territories, including the Coleridge Ruhr, which that, that's in the west of Germany, west central Germany. So in 1871, here's a familiar name, Pr uh, Prussian minister, president, Otto von Bismarck, he united most of the German principalities into the German Empire under Prussian leadership. But many considered this to be a lesser Germany because they didn't include Austria or Switzerland. So, of course, in November 1918, the monarchies were abolished and the nobility lost its political power because there was the German Revolution, 1918 and 1919. So this is a great map created by someone by Matt Head who shares it in Creative Commons. And it's, uh, it's showing some of Germany's province of East Prussia from 1923 to 1939, World War II. And this up here is Memel Land, which of course, Memel is modern day uh, Klaipeda in Lithuania. And uh, you know, this has been occupied by Lithuania since 1923. So here we've got Lithuania. There it was Memel Land. Now that's Lithuania too. Up here, um, you can see a little of Latvia in the blue there, okay. This is East Prussia, okay. Green here is Poland. Here you can see it's a, it says it's the free city of Danzig, which of course today is Gdansk in Poland. But here you can see, in, here's Konigsberg in Prussia. Here's this lagoon, which you'll see how the river um, drains into that. Here's the Baltic Sea. So this is a great map um, showing East Prussia right before World War II, after World War I into World War II. So you see how the map has changed here some, significantly actually. Okay, so the Kingdom of Prussia was abolished in favor of a republic, the Free State of Prussia, um, and that was a state of Germany from 1918 until 1933. There was a Prussian coup, they lost their independence, uh, and then the Nazis came into power. Um, it's interesting that uh, some Prussian ministries were kept even with uh, the Nazis, and uh, Hermann Goring, yes, that, that evil man himself, remained in his role as Minister President of Prussia until the end of World War II. So this is a good picture of Konigsberg Castle, there's a monument there too, um, for the German Emperor William I. This was in what is now uh, Kaliningrad, Russia, but it was Konigsberg back then, and that's Konigsberg Castle, so pretty cool. So Konigsberg was the easternmost large city in Germany until World War II. Okay, it was heavily damaged by Allied bombing in 1944. During the Battle of Konigsberg in 1945, it was occupied by the Soviet Union. And then in 1945, there's the Potsdam Agreement, and the, the territory was placed provisionally under Soviet administration and it was annexed in 1945, April 9, 1945. So then the Soviets expelled the German population and repopulated it with Russians and others from the Soviet Union. In 1946 it was renamed to Kaliningrad in honor of Soviet leader Mikhail Kalinin. So it's now the capital of Russia's Kaliningrad Oblast and in the final settlement treaty of 1990, Germany renounced all claim to it. So that's how Russia got this land. You know, there's so much uh, more to be learned about Prussia, but not for us today. You know, at being on the Baltic Sea there, it's an important port city, always has been. And a lot of important and influential and uh, very smart people came from Konigsberg and in the area and, and did their work there. Um, between the 13th and 20th centuries, the inhabitants spoke predominantly German, but as you could infer from the maps, you know, it was a multicultural city right on the port there. There's a, a had a profound influence upon the Lithuanian and Polish cultures. So, for example, the city was a publishing center of Lutheran literature, including the first Polish translation of the New Testament, which was printed in the city of Konigsberg, 1551. Um, it, 
that's where the first book in Lithuanian was printed and the first Lutheran catechism, both printed in Konigsberg in 1547. This, probably don't recognize, but you'll know the name, is Immanuel Kant. Here's a fun with maps fact. So, Konigsberg was a university city. It had Albertina University, and it became a German intellectual and cultural center. Um, and, and Kant lived there. He's born there, lived there virtually all his life, the philosopher. Rarely traveled more than 10 miles away from the city his whole life. So he entered the university there in Konigsberg, and he's still at like 16, and he got into metaphysics and he became the chair there. Um, and he published his critique of pure reason and his metaphysics of morals. You know, that's basically that says uh, virtue is acquired by the performance of duty for its own sake. So Kant is, the whole Kantian philosophy is fascinating and uh, He's, he's really one of the uh, uh, leading figures of uh, philosophy. In fact, he was such a big deal that in 1974, uh, West Germany uh, made this postage stamp commemorating the 250th anniversary of, his, of Kant's birth. So, Konigsberg was one of the few Baltic ports regularly visited by more than 100 ships annually in the latter 16th century, along with Danzig and Riga. Of course, remember Danzig is modern day Gdansk. And the university became a center of Protestant teaching because all these people were coming in. It had a profound impact on the development of Lithuanian culture, and several important Lithuanian writers attended what they called the Albertina, after, uh, named after Duke Albert. So, Konigsberg was the birthplace of the mathematician Christian Goldbach, and writers like E.T.A. Hoffman as well. But Goldbach, I gotta tell you about him. Goldbach's conjecture is one of the oldest and best known unsolved problems in mathematics, uh, in number theory, in all of mathematics, really. It's very simple to understand, too. The problem is, it states that Goldbach's conjecture, every even whole number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers. That sounds really simple. Anyone can understand it. And, but it's really unsolved. The conjecture has been shown to hold for all integers less than a huge number, something like 4 times 10 to the 18th, but it remains unproven, you know, completely, despite considerable effort. So the Goldbach conjecture, huge thing. But wait, there's more. In 1736, the mathematician Leonard Euler used the arrangement of the city's bridges and islands as a basics for a, a famous problem in mathematics called the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg. This problem led to the mathematical branches of graph theory and eventually topology. And believe it or not, another great mathematician, David Hilbert, was uh, born in Konigsberg later. So as a mathematician, I have to drill down a little here. So stay with me. I think it's pretty interesting. So the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg is a it's historically notable problem. Um, and Leonard Euler came up with a negative resolution of it in 1736. And I, like I said, that laid the foundation of graph theory and prefigured the idea of topology. So here we've got Konigsberg, and it was on both sides of the Pragel River, and included two large islands, okay, Knipoff and Lomsey. They were connected to each other or to the mainland, two mainland portions of the city by seven bridges. So here we go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay. The problem was to devise a walk through the city that would cross each of those bridges once and only once. Okay, So Euler proved that the problem has no solution. <clears throat> when you're, Especially when you're proving something in the negative, you've got to have a whole uh, rigor to it. You can't just pull out a few examples and show that they don't work. So in the history of mathematics, Euler's solution of the Konigsberg Bridge problem is considered to be the first theorem of graph theory, the first true proof in the theory of networks, and now it's a subject now generally regarded as a branch of combinatorics. You know, in addition, Euler's recognition that the key information was the number of bridges and the list of their endpoints rather than their exact positions presaged the development of uh, the field of math called topology. The difference between the actual layout and the graph schematic is a good example of the idea that topology is not concerned with the rigid shape of objects. So the important thing was the seven bridges and their endpoints, not some of the rigid stuff inside there. 
in topology, um, the shape doesn't matter. My professor always taught that a topologist can't tell the difference between a coffee cup and a donut because you can bend and twist and extend. You know, there's a hole in your coffee cup handle and there's a hole in the donut, so they're equivalent in topology. But this is a picture of the uh, Konigsberg Cathedral and this bridge on the right. This is one of the two surviving bridges from Euler's time. So there were seven bridges in his problem between wars and all that. Uh, there's only two left, but here's one of them. Okay, you know, um, think about Sheldon Cooper in the Big Bang series TV show. As a theoretical physicist, he's involved in abstraction. Whereas his friend Leonard would be more concerned with the application of the theory of crossing the bridges. So philosophers have known that Euler's proof is not about an abstraction or a model of reality, but directly about the real arrangement of bridges. So that shows the certainty of mathematical proof can apply directly to reality. So Sheldon's work can lead to Leonard's application. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. But let's get back to Konigsberg. I encourage you to read about the fascinating but tragic events in the area when Hitler came to power. Um, for this episode, we'll just repeat that at the Potsdam Conference, Northern Prussia, including Konigsberg, was annexed by the USSR, which attached it to the Russian SFSR. In 1946, the city's name was changed to Kaliningrad. Um, Northern Prussia remained part of the Soviet Union until its dissolution in 1991 and since then has been an exclave of the Russian Federation. This is a said. great map from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, let's take a look. So here's Russia over here. You got Moscow up here, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Germany, Czech Republic. Here's Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and then the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And right in here, on the Baltic Sea is a piece of Russia, that oblast, here's Kaliningrad, okay? We got Gdansk over here and Klaipeda up here, but this, this little section is part of this big Russia here, and now you know why. So the term oblast dates as far back as the Russian Empire, you know, from 1849 to 1917, and they're basically administrative areas. Um, you know, they, they were positioned around the borders of the country or in areas inhabited by Cossacks and East Slavic speaking people. So when you had the Soviet Union come around from 1922 to 1991, oblasts were again organized, utilized to organize the Union. So uh, they would divide these land masses into districts and municipalities all under the direction of an oblast. Okay, um, under Soviet Union there were 13 European oblasts and 8 Asian oblasts. Once the Soviet Union fell, um, some countries continued to use oblasts, or another term with the same meetings, to organize their newly formed nation. That included Uzbekistan, Ukraine, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Russia of course, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Bulgaria, Belarus, and Armenia. So, Russia's got a total of 85 subjects, and of these, 46 are considered This oblast. is a great map by someone called Norman Einstein, who um, used the Creative Commons to let us use it. Um, so, the Kaliningrad in here, it's at the mouth of uh, the Pregolia River, which is navigable. That empties into the Stula Lagoon here. And that's just an inlet of the Baltic Sea. So you can see it here. It's kind of small, but you can see it here. Is that, there's that inlet of the Baltic Sea. Um, the Kaliningrad region is one of Russia's smallest regions, obviously, in terms of area and population. It's the westernmost we've seen already. Um, it's the only ice-free port of Russia in the Baltic states on the Baltic Sea. So if you go up to Klaipeda, and others here, they're not ice free year round. So that shows how important Kaliningrad is. It's ice free year round. Um, in 2020, it had a population of uh, 489,000. 
and about 800,000 residents in the urban area around it. It's the second largest city in the Russia's Northwestern Federal District after St. Petersburg, the third largest city in the Baltic region, and the seventh largest city on the Baltic Sea. So well, it's pretty big, it's only 86.11 square miles uh, measured in 2013. So it's small in area, but it's it's got a pretty decent sized population. You know, it's a major transport hub with the sea and river ports. So it's home, as you might imagine, to the uh, Baltic fleet of the Russian navies. It's one of the largest industrial centers in Russia. So it's very strategic here because Russia's way over here. And then you've got this port city here, uh, part of Russia, right on the Baltic Sea. And you can use it year round because it doesn't ice up. With the Cold War and all, um, it's its strategic importance grew even more and it was closed the whole Kaliningrad Oblast was closed to foreign visitors. In 1957 an agreement was signed and later came into force which delimited the, mo the border between Poland and the Soviet Union so you know this is with all the territories in doubt and uh, being fought for this is kind of well established and there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, a lot of issues with it at this time. Here's a fun with maps fact. While in the 1990s many Soviet era city names uh, commemorating the communist leaders were changed, you know, like they changed uh, Leningrad back to St. Petersburg up here um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Kaliningrad remains named as it was. So Here's St. Petersburg. It was Leningrad. USSR fell, went back to St. Petersburg. But Kaliningrad stayed Kaliningrad. So today the overwhelming majority of Kaliningrad's residents are Russians. They brought them in after 1945. There's a minority of population from other Slavic ethnic groups, including Belarusians and Ukrainians. Um, there's small communities, Tatars, Germans, Armenians, Poles, and Lithuanians. So this is the old coat of arms of Konigsberg. Of course, it's not in effect anymore because it's Kaliningrad. But here's, so let's wrap it up with the fun with maps fact. Besides Immanuel Kant and the mathematicians we spoke of and the writers and other notables who were born in Kaliningrad, um, we also have Alexei Leonov, who was the first person to walk in space. But here's a, maybe even a little more interesting right now. Lyudmila Putina, born in 1958, is the ex-wife of Vladimir Putin, so the ex-first lady of Russia. She was also born there, too. So that's a look at Konigsberg, Kaliningrad. And unfortunately, we're seeing maps of the world, maps of this area so much in the news today. But that's one of the reasons we do fun with maps, is to see how maps of the world influence history and current events and all. So speaking of current events, um, the city of Norfolk, Virginia was a twin, a sister city of Kaliningrad, but in February or March of this year, 2022, they suspended that relationship because of the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Other twin cities, sister cities of uh, Kaliningrad also broke off the relationship, including Gdansk, Poland. I hope you had as much fun with this map as I did. I hope I didn't bore you too much with the mathematics, but the two problems we looked at are, are two of the, the major problems of math. If you, had, if you like this, please click like and consider subscribing so you never miss an episode. Until next time, I'm your host, Dan Hansen. Keep on having fun with maps.